Keeping filament dry is essential for consistent 3D printing. While the severity of this varies based on local climate and the material being used, filament drying is a major part of ensuring strong layer adhesion, dimensional accuracy, and reducing print defects like stringing. Doing a quick search on the channel, I've made approximately 10 videos covering filament drying and looking at different drying solutions. We've looked at a handful of dryers from iBoss, including their EaseDry, Cyclops, and the most recent Polyphemus that introduced a motor to rotate the filament for even drying. Around August of last year, they reached out to me letting me know that they were developing a drying solution for Bamboo Labs AMS. This really piqued my interest because I'm constantly using my AMSs and I upgraded one of them to the Python, but the stock AMS system only has a couple of compartments for desiccant and no options for active drying. A couple of months ago, they followed up with me, letting me know that the unit was finally ready and offered to send one over for testing. I agreed, and shortly after, the iBoss Tetris arrived. In today's video, we'll be diving into Tetris. We'll go over what the unit is, what the installation process is like, go through some testing, and I'll share my overall thoughts based on my time with it so far. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Before going over the specs of Tetris, I want to address the elephant in the room. With the release of Bamboo Labs H2D, they came out with an AMS2 Pro unit, which has active filament drying, so why would you want Tetris? Well, there's a few reasons I can think of. For starters, there is a lot more AMS units out there than AMS2 Pros. At the time of recording, the Tetris is on pre-order for $179 showing a price after that of $200. This is compared to the AMS2 Pro coming in at $359. So upgrading your original AMS could save you some money. Unlike with Tetris, the AMS2 Pro will not let you dry while printing and you can only set one temperature for the entire unit. And finally, the AMS2 Pro requires you to update your printer's firmware and for anyone that's been holding off on updating because they don't want to break direct compatibility with Orca Slicer, this gives you an upgrade path to get drying in your AMS unit without the need to upgrade. Thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring today's video. With over a decade of experience, PCBWay provides reliable, high quality PCB prototyping and fabrication with super fast turnaround times. In addition to PCBs, they offer CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, and injection molding services. I recently used their SLM printing for a 3D printed tool head, and the results were fantastic. Whether your project is big or small, PCBWay has you covered with order quantities from five to 10,000 boards. Use the link in the description to get a $5 credit towards your first order today. So what exactly is it and how does it work? The simplest way I can describe Tetris is an upgrade for your AMS unit that gives you drying functionality. It requires an original AMS unit and the kit provides everything else to convert it over to Tetris. With the exception of the stock clear cover, all other parts of the original AMS are used. The upgrade contains four separate heating elements and divides the four spool slots into small separate drying units using a combination of a divided lid and small panels that get added to the unit. This lets you set a unique drying temperature for each of the different lanes depending on the type of filament you're drying. The maximum temperature you're able to set a lane to is 65 Celsius, so it is compatible with a wide range of materials, but might not get quite hot enough for things like polycarbonate. My theory is that that 65 Celsius might have been the cap that they were able to use before the housing of the AMS unit itself were to start warping. Each of the heaters has its own screen and that's where you'll interface with the heater for that lane as well as set your specific parameters. The power button is used to power on the lane, cycle to humidity mode, or power the lane off. Underneath that is the option button. This lets you cycle through PLA, ABS, PTG, TPU, and two other custom temperature profiles. The settings gear is where you set the drying temperature from 20 to 65 Celsius, adjust drying time from 30 minutes to 24 hours, and choose the drying power of low, medium, and high. You can also choose if you want the drying to just completely shut off when the timer runs out, or kick into a humidity mode where 
it will be off until humidity climbs and then it will turn itself on until your set humidity target is reached. Holding the setting button down for five seconds lets you swap between Fahrenheit and Celsius. Underneath this is the second stage drying mode. I haven't played around with this option much, but I believe it lets you set a different set of parameters for that lane that will activate when the time has ran out for the primary drying settings. One complaint I've seen on quite a few of the dryer videos I've made is that many of the dryers don't have any form of an exhaust. While these dryers may be generating heat, there's no easy way for the moisture to actually leave the unit. I've used plenty of these dryers for years and I can confirm that they do indeed dry your filament, but I've also seen quite a few mods that open up some of these dryers in order to help with the drying efficiency. With Tetris, each drying lane has its own cover that lifts during the drying process, providing a fairly large path for moisture to exit. Once the dryer stops or it's been completed, it drops that cover to seal the chamber. This is something I've never seen on any dryer that I've played around with. And based on those comments, I think many will be very happy with this. Each lane has a sensor for reading its humidity and temperature, as well as a fan that's blowing air from the heating element towards the spool of filament. One thing there is no shortage of with Tetris is cables. Each heater module has one cable going to the power supply and a second cable running up to the screen. The ones for the screens are routed underneath through some risers, but the heaters themselves combined with these cables adds a fair bit of depth to the overall AMS footprint. Now let's touch on the setup and installation process. Inside the box is everything you need to upgrade your AMS to Tetris. There's a fair amount of parts and my recommendation is to take everything out of the box and get yourself organized before beginning the upgrade. The first step is to remove the top cover from your AMS so that we can replace it with the Tetris one that has the heater modules. The four screws holding the lid in place can be accessed from the underside of the AMS and they require some really long drivers. While I probably could have made one of the drivers that I have here work, the kit does include an extra long driver in the box, so that's what you'll need for removing and then reinstalling those screws to the new cover. After this, you'll install risers to the underside of the AMS, route the cables through there, install the screen and power supply modules on top of the risers, plug everything in, and install some rubbery adhesive feed to the base. On the inside of the AMS, there's a handful of baffles and acrylic fixings to put in place to isolate each lane from the rest of the device. There's a silicone strip that gets installed at the back of the device to seal everything in, but the lanes themselves are just separated by pieces of acrylic that butt up against each other. Upgrading from the AMS to Tetris isn't that difficult, and I would say for most it's probably a 20 to maybe 30 minute upgrade, but I did run into a few issues during the upgrade process. The first was some cracked parts for the pieces that secure the screens to the base. Ibis emailed me a few days before receiving this unit to actually give me a heads up about this. I guess at the factory, whatever adhesive was used on those parts, which are ABS, had a chemical reaction which caused them to become really brittle and crack during shipping. As far as I'm aware, this was isolated to just the handful of initial tester review units. And in my case, they provided me with STL files. So I printed all those parts again out of ABS, removed all of the adhesive so it wouldn't happen again and reinstalled the screens onto those brackets. The only other issue I ran into was with the front baffles inside of the AMS. Based on the images in the manual, I couldn't exactly tell how they were supposed to fit in, which led to me pushing mine in a little bit too far and having it sort of fall into the housing of the AMS. And as I was trying to fish it out, it, it just cracked. My original thought with it being acrylic was just to laser cut out a replacement, but because of its shape, I ended up taking my calipers and 3D modeling a replacement that I just printed out of PTG and that's been working fine for me since. Since this dryer uses four separate heating elements and is quite a bit different than any dryer I've ever tested, I had quite a few questions. The first thing I wanted to know was how much power is this thing going to be drawing if all four heaters are activated at the same time? Tetris has its own integrated power supply and power cable, so it plugs directly into the wall and doesn't draw power from your printer. We have 15 amp circuits here and I've tripped them multiple times over the past year by just heating two printers at the same time, 
So this was the first thing I set out to test. So I grabbed my power meter, connected Tetris, and powered up all four heaters. The highest point I saw was right around 325 watts. Once each lane reached its temperature, it dropped down to around 250 watts with an occasional spike up to around that 300. This is actually quite a bit lower than I was expecting, and if you're not using all four lanes at once, it's going to be significantly less than that. The next thing I wanted to know was how even is the heating inside of one of these lanes? In some of the past dryers we've looked at, we've seen pretty sizable differences in temperature from the top to the bottom of the unit, or from the side where the heating element's at to the opposite side of the dryer. To test this, I grabbed my thermocouple thermometer and taped a probe at the front, at the bottom, at the center, and one right where the air comes out of the heater. Every dryer I've used prior to this has some sort of a port uh, where the filament comes out, so that way I can shove those thermocouples through there. But because the AMS feeds the filament downward and then it comes out a single tube on the back, I didn't have easy access to get those probes in there. So I ended up feeding them all the way to the front and then putting a little bit of weight on top from a spool of filament to try to keep it as closed as possible, but there was still a slight gap on the lid. I then set the lane to heat up to 60 Celsius and monitored the temperature of the four different probes. I checked the temperature every 10 minutes over the course of an hour and was shocked to see that from the highest temperature read to the lowest temperature read, the deviation was under two Celsius. As far as I can recall, this is the most even temperature I've seen out of any dryer I've tested. The other thing I noticed was at the 10 minute mark, the dryer claimed it had reached 60 Celsius, but my probes all read right around 50. At around 25 minutes, they were showing 54 Celsius, and that seems to be where they topped out for the remaining hour of my drying. I don't doubt that the slight gap from my wires on the outside, as well as between the lanes, could have had an impact on this, but I still have a feeling that it's probably at two to three Celsius lower than the temperature that it's claiming on the screen. If I had a choice, I would choose for the readings on the screens to be spot on, but if I had to choose between it under or over reporting, I would choose this. There have been a few other instances where dryers have said they're at a certain temperature or that's the temperature they're trying to reach, but the air coming out is substantially hotter, which could lead to warping and just destroying the filament that you're actually trying to dry. The next thing I was curious about was how well does it actually isolate the temperature from one lane to the next one. For this test, I used the same thermocouples, but I just installed one into the first lane and one into the second lane. I then set the temperature for lane one to 45 and lane two to 65 Celsius. I monitored the temperatures for around 45 minutes and was really happy to see lane one read spot on 45 Celsius and lane two showing 61 Celsius. Based on those results, I feel confident in being able to place different materials with varying drying needs or parameters without running into any sort of issues. For anyone wondering about sound, with all four heaters on and the drying mode set to the default, which is medium, standing one foot away from the Tetris read 42 decibels. This is way quieter than any dryer I've tested in quite a long time. Don't get me wrong, you can still absolutely hear the fans, but Compared to the last at least two that I've tested that were larger dryers, it is substantially quieter and I don't mind working in the same room while this is running. I always get requests in these dryer videos to print with a wet spool of filament, then dry that spool of filament, and then print the exact same thing to show the results. And the issue is me living in a low humidity environment. This has proven to be quite difficult. There's an orange spool of TPU that I tried printing with a few weeks ago and I swore I saw a handful of moisture issues with it. So I grabbed that and the A1 Mini and threw a Benchy down on that printer. And looking at the results, there was a couple of two super tiny strings, but nothing substantial enough that if I dried out that spool, you'd really be able to see much of any difference. The one thing I typically do and did do this time was another one of the sponge tests. For this, I grabbed a kitchen sponge, cut it in half, and added water to it until it weighed 20 grams. I then threw it into the first lane at 50 Celsius and checked on it every 30 minutes until it was back down to its starting weight of 5 grams. The reason I went with 50 Celsius is because I'm more interested in testing the dryer's efficiency than just hitting it with as much heat as possible, and that's also 
the parameters I've gone with in the previous sponge dryer test videos I've done. After five checks or approximately two and a half hours, the sponge was back down to six grams, so almost fully dry, which is pretty much spot on to what the time frame has been on most of the other dryers I've tested. I'd hoped that because of the back opening and closing, maybe we'd see a slight bit of a decrease in time needed to dry it, but from this at least initial test, that didn't seem to be the case. With the exception of the adhesive issue for those screen mounts and the self-inflicted damage I did to that one baffle, the experience I've had so far with Tetris has been largely positive. My P1S lives down in the garage and is exposed to more humidity, so this seems like the perfect setup to have attached to that printer. The only thing I'm a little curious about is what the longevity is going to be of the mechanism that raises and lowers these vents in the back. When it's closing and it's doing its final couple of steps, it makes a bit of a clicking sound. As far as I can tell from looking in, it just looks like a small motor and the polyphemus dryer also used, I think a similar style motor that did make some sounds during the initial sort of break-in period. The one on that dryer was user replaceable, so I'm hoping that maybe these will also be user serviceable. If moisture hasn't been much of an issue for you, then this upgrade might be a bit overkill, especially when you consider that you can get a single spool standalone dryer for about a fourth of the cost. But for someone that's primarily printing with Bamboo Lab printers and using the original AMS unit, this seems like a sweet way to dry out spools and make sure that they stay dry. There's a lot of drying options out there, with many of them sort of being just a copy paste. So it's been really nice to see a company like Ibis continue to find ways to innovate on filament drying. I can't imagine that trying to incorporate a drying system around the stock AMS was trivial, but I'm glad the option exists, especially considering how many are using AMSs on a daily basis. And that's been Tetris. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you have a better understanding of what this is, what the upgrade process is like, and whether this is something that makes sense for your specific setup. If you do have any questions, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer. And as always, if I don't know the answer to your questions, I have no problem reaching out directly to IBIS to try to get those answers for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you want to support the channel further, I'll have links in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.